Hi, it's Dwyer, richarddwyer.com, my law firm site, keepingitfree.blogspot.com, a financial blog that I run. I hope you visit both. Today is April the 26th, 2020. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, there is an excellent show on TV. I completely enjoyed season one without realizing that the detective at the center of the show, a guy with a photographic memory, you don't meet many people like him, Pat Postiglione, was actually the detective who investigated the murder of Steve McNair, former quarterback of the Tennessee Titans. Now, he actually discusses the McNair investigation in Season 2, Episode 1. Right? Let's do so here. Let's also talk about some parts of the show, as well as some additional facts that deserve consideration. Let me just say, before the show, I had my doubts about the official version of events concerning McNair's murder. After watching the show, those doubts have been removed, right? I believe that Pat Postiglione's conclusion of a murder-suicide is the right conclusion. Let's talk about Steve McNair's girlfriend and let's talk about Steve McNair. Now understand there's a huge age gap between the two of them. Right, of more than a decade and a half. Jenny is 20. Steve, I believe, is 36 years old. Jenny was a waitress at Dave and Buster's at Opry Mills. Right, she had moved to Nashville at 16 with her then boyfriend, Keith Norfleet. Now, the two of them were together for several years. They were together for four years before recently breaking up. She breaks up with Norfleet just a few months before she meets Steve McNair. Now, Steve McNair is married. Again, he's 36 or so. He's married to Michelle McNair. He's a father. In fact, he has four kids. Let me point out, too, that his marriage was a long-term marriage. McNair had been married more than a decade. Now, it's very important here to understand that even though McNair is known, even though McNair is married and he's publicly married. His wife is not a secret to anybody in Nashville. Jenny does not see herself as a mistress. She thinks Steve is going to leave his wife for her. Let's also take this moment to talk about Jenny's personality. Her live-in boyfriend of four years, Keith Norfleet, maintains that Jenny was a positive person. She was almost always upbeat. This is not a person known to go through very long blue moods. Let me point out, too, that she has some friends out there who strongly question whether the Jenny they knew could ever take part in a murder-suicide. Well, on the Total Recall show, and it's on ID Network, again, it's Season 2, Episode 1, right? They've waited until Season 2 to tell you that Pat Postiglione was the detective who worked on this famous case, right? On the show, understand, there's a friend who claims to have been present as Steve talked about his future with Jenny together. There were also text messages from Steve 
that suggests that Steve was telling Jenny that he was going to leave his wife. That the two of them were going to be together. In reality, Steve is a player. He's renting a place with other men that doesn't have his name on the lease that they're using to meet up with women, right? It is a friends with benefits, private meeting place type of setup, right? The guys take their girlfriends there as they maintain public personas of being married men to other women. Now, Jenny knew that Steve was married. Jenny also found out that not only was Steve having an affair with her, he was also having an affair with at least one other woman. On the Total Recall show, a mistress of McNair, Leah Ignani, is quoted as saying that as she left McNair's friends with benefits place, right? His apartment in the city that he shares with other guys. She noticed that she was being followed by a Cadillac Escalade SUV that looked like Jenny's. She also saw the Escalade SUV by her apartment parked on the street outside her building. She also noticed the Escalade SUV circling her block. Now this hints at stalking by Jenny. It hints of mental instability. There's also a financial angle that you should be aware of. Jenny sees herself as financially strapped. She lived in an upscale apartment, but like many young people, looks are deceiving, right? On the Total Recall show, they point out that her roommate had moved out. And so Jenny would have to pay the rent of $1,000 a month, and let's remember, this is in 2009. Right, a thousand dollars a month then was big money in Nashville. She would have to pay the thousand dollars a month rent by herself. In effect, it would be a doubling of her rent. On the show, they also point out that she was having problems making payments, and this is crucial, on her black Cadillac Escalade SUV. Right, according to reports. That vehicle costs $800 a month. Now, some reports say that she got it from Steve McNair, that Steve McNair bought it for her. I believe those reports are misleading. If Steve bought it for her, then she wouldn't have to make payments on it. Maybe Steve made the initial down payment for the car. But understand, the car was costing her a lot of money. And it was only one of the vehicles she owned. She actually drove a Kia. So Steve McNair gets her this car. She's the one responsible for making payments. And the payments are bleeding her financially. The payments are almost as much as she's paying for her rent. Again, she's only 20 years old. Now... On the show, and I thought this was very important, I did not know this fact. On the show, they point out that she sold it to a friend. But the friend returned the Cadillac SUV to her because the friend had problems making payments. So understand, Jenny is saddled with this car. It has her feeling financially strapped. So, 
understand, on July the 2nd, right, less than 48 hours before Steve McNair and Jenny are found dead, Jenny, during a break at work, she's literally at her job at Dave and Buster's. She goes outside for a prearranged meeting in the parking lot with ex-convict Adrian Gillum. They get in a car and Adrian Gillum sells her a 9mm semi-automatic that's loaded for $100. Right? Let me just back away a second here. Move this back a few hours, right? This is the portion of July the 2nd when she's at work. Understand in the early morning hours of July the 2nd, Thursday, July the 2nd, right before the July 4th holiday weekend, Jenny, with Steve McNair in the car and a friend, was busted for a DUI in the Caddy SUV. She was taken to jail. Steve McNair and the friend moved away. They weren't arrested. She was arrested. Steve McNair then posted bail for her. Now it's important in terms of all of us understanding the relationship to know that Steve McNair, after posting bail for Jenny that night and getting her out of jail, then goes and spends the night with his other mistress, Leah Ignani. Well, let me continue. Jenny, who is worried about her finances, understand, she's up against it, pays $100 for the 9mm semi-automatic. Now understand, that's a lot of money for Jenny. She's worried about money as it is. And yet here, the same day that she's bailed out of jail, when she goes to work, right, she's so strapped she can't even take the work day off. When she goes to work, she's spending $100 to buy a 9mm semi-automatic. Let me also say too, that I know there are many, and understand, this is a famous crime that has many different points of view. I know there are many who believe that the ex-con, Adrian Gillum, who sold her the gun, was somehow involved in the murder that takes place less than 48 hours earlier, uh, later. I don't believe he is. Understand, the police, as you can imagine, investigated this angle fully. There's no evidence that Adrian Gilliam was ever at the crime scene. There's no evidence that he is there the early morning hours of July the 4th. More importantly, he fully cooperates with police. He's the one who tells them about the gun sale, right? He's the one who tells them about the fact that he received $100. Understand, by the way, here's my daughter, right? So this story hits home for me, right? People with families. Um, okay, okay, come on. Give daddy some air time. <laughs> he's, he's the one knowing that it's illegal as an ex-felon to have a gun who tells the cops that yes, he had the gun and he sold it to Jenny. I believe his cooperation, <laughs> I believe his cooperation, come on, don't bounce. I believe his cooperation with the police, right? And the lack of forensic evidence tying him to the crime exonerates him. I don't believe he's involved. If you do, then I hope you make that case, and I know many do. I hope you make that case in the comment section 
of this video. Right? So, let's talk about how financially strapped Jenny was. On July the 2nd, again, a lot's happening on July the 2nd. She's in jail, she's bailed out, she buys a gun in a parking lot during a break at work. On that date, she also places an ad on Craigslist to sell her living room and kitchen furniture. Now, I believe this is significant for a couple of reasons. Right? This information has layers. Let's think about it. It shows that she felt that she needed money. It might show that she planned on moving out. Right? But it also shows, in my opinion, that on July the 2nd, the same date when she's buying a firearm, that she was not planning on killing herself. Right? It doesn't make sense for me to know that I'm planning on seeing Steve McNear in 48 hours and I'm planning on ending it all while I'm also trying to sell my furniture. If I'm selling my furniture to pay bills, then that means I plan to be around when the bills are paid. If I'm going to stiff my creditors by killing myself, then I'm not going to be putting the ad on Craigslist on July the 2nd. Now let's address some folklore related to this case. Right? CBS reported that on the date she died, Jenny had more than $2,500 in her checking account. So they're claiming that she had enough to pay her bills. Let me just say that that thought is incorrect, because understand, $2,000 of the $2,500 that Jenny had in her checking account came from Steve McNair on July the 3rd. Right, Jenny actually texted Steve. Check the text records. She texted him, baby, I need to pay the cell phone bills in the hospital. Can you transfer $2,000 to my account? And Steve McNair, on July the 3rd, the date after Jenny gets the handgun, Steve McNair transfers $2,000 to Jenny's checking account. So understand, Jenny only had about $500 in her checking account before Steve transfers $2,000 to that account on July the 3rd. Let's also remember, the SUV costs $800 a month. Jenny thought she had gotten rid of it. The friend returned it. That car is still with her. Understand, the rent is $1,000 a month. If you had been paying $500 and a roommate the other $500, that thousand's going to feel unaffordable when that roommate moves out. Let's also consider the timing here. Many landlords require that rent be paid at the beginning of the month. Well, it was July the 2nd, July the 3rd, right? The beginning of the month. Any financial pressure that Jenny felt would be magnified. And so we get to Friday, July the 3rd. Jenny shows up at work. It is the Friday before the July 4th holiday, right? July 4th is the next day. That year, July 4th, fell on a Saturday. So here it's Friday, July the 3rd. And surprisingly, it is a slow night at Dave & Buster's. Jenny is talking with the co-worker. The co-worker is actually on the ID show Total Recall. Right? Jenny talks with the co-worker. She tells the co-worker that her life was a ball of, use your imagination here, the word rhymes with sit, and then says, I should just end it. Right? This is the evening of July the 3rd. The co-worker thinks she's talking about her relationship with Steve McNair. Again, the line is, I should just end it. Now there are text messages. 
which they detail on the Total Recall show from Jenny to McNair that establish that she badly wanted to see him. Late night, July the 3rd. Early morning, July the 4th. At the apartment Steve kept in town. Right? She badly wanted to see him. It is a series of texts that she sends him that urges him to meet her at his apartment. Now that takes us to the morning of July the 4th. Steve shows up after midnight. Right? Understand. It's just the two of them. So the timing has a range. We don't have the third party witness who can say Steve showed up at 1245. Right? We just know that Steve was out. And he shows up after midnight. He's drunk. He has a blood alcohol level of 0 0.015, almost twice the legal limit. He slumps on the sofa. Now, Detective Pat Postiglione believes that McNair falls asleep on the sofa given the lack of defensive wounds, as well as the alcohol content. Right? Jenny is wearing a sexy nightgown. Now keep in mind, they're not at Jenny's place. They're at Steve's apartment in town. Right? Yet, even though they're at Steve's apartment, Jenny has bought her new gun with her and curiously has it in the living room. She has this gun less than 48 hours and yet ballistics show that the gun shoots McNair four times twice in the head and twice in the chest I believe Jenny decided to kill him and did this is what I want to talk about with my four year old in the room but okay just <laughs> bear with me she then shoots herself in the head in such a way that she would fall into his lap. Her body would later roll onto the floor by his feet, where it is found a few hours later. You will lie? Yes, I believe this was a murder-suicide. If you believe differently, and I know many of Jenny's friends do, tell us about it in the comment section of this video. In my opinion, Jenny needed the world to know that on a U.S. holiday, July the 4th, she had been involved with Steve McNair. I believe the mindset is best summed up by Ted Bundy who once said, murder is not about lust, and it's not about violence. It's about possession. Jenny needed to possess Steve McNair. She didn't want to lose him, and didn't want to share him with other women. This was her way of owning him, and of forcing us to think of her when we thought of him. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. The show is Total Recall. It is season two, episode one. The detective is brilliant. I'm not kidding. Pat Postiglione has a photographic memory. It's obvious in how he describes events. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.